Ladies and gentlemen, please also prepare to laugh your asses off. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chris Rush. Hello. Do you, you notice he said, and prepare yourself to laugh your asses off? Because it's a theater setting, and because I'm a stand-up comedian, I've done theaters, but it always says, stand up, act, giggle, piss yourself, laugh. People know before they get in. But we've had people come here and look at the strange bald man and go, what, what the fuck's he do? Is he going to spin little dishes on sticks and shit like that? No, I'm a, I'm a comedian. There's no doubt about that. I know you're all stressed. Look, let's not kid ourselves. We live on fear now. Let's go back to a nostalgic time. Let's go back to a time when there was less worry and hassle. When was that time? The prenatal period. <laughs> that was so cool. You're floating there in liquid love. You're cosmically comfy. No hassle. Once in a while, mom had a little... Caffeine, you felt fidgety. And you didn't know about walking then, so you kind of just spun. And then all of a sudden, you feel the walls come in on you, and you're squirted out into bright, incredible light with the novelty of smell, hospital smell. And then a giant in a mask picks you up by the feet and smacks you on the ass. And you cry. Who wouldn't? And it's been one bad fucking thing after the other since then. But here we are now, and you came out in this incredible heat. It's like a, a, a low-scale nuclear attack that they're not mentioning. <laughs> and you're New Yorkers. You, you actually, you understand it's not easy. You didn't just, you weren't like the beloved Krell. You didn't say, I want to be at Bleecker Street and appear. It was a sophisticated order from your brain to the autonomic nervous system to flex your ass, balance, and move and come to this theater. In order for a, a human to have the motivation to go through the sequence of servo mechanisms to move your ass, you had to have a fairly powerful motivation, especially for the fact that there's leeches and big ferns growing outside. <laughs> and that motivation, of course, was laughter. Now, I could see, I could see most of you. The lighting's wonderful, Bill. I can see them all. Even people with large pores. I'm not looking. <laughs> what's, the motive? what's so damn good about laughter? Well, you know the long-term stuff. It makes you live longer. Gets rid of free radicals, produces interleukin, greatest cancer fighter in the world, gets rid of broken cell walls. However, those are long-term effects. You're New Yorkers. You want to know now? What the fuck is going to be right now? <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. Most modern 21st century humans are impatient. But New Yorkers are the most impatient people in the world. Here's a New Yorker getting hit by lightning. Come on, fucking hit me. Hurry up. <laughs> so I want to wait around and put my ass in the microwave, wait for the little bell. Come on, move. <laughs> Well, when you laugh heavy, I don't mean bullshit laugh, like, ho, ho, ho. I mean the real, like, heavy shit where you make a little pig noise, and snot flies across the room and lands on what used to be a good friend. When you make that heavy pig snort and snot flinging laughter, the human brain secretes a chemical called endorphin, which means indigenous morphine. You laugh like that for an hour, you're stoned out of your fucking mind. You can't even pee straight. Oh, shit. So you get your instant gratification right there, and that's what I just here. did, in essence, was take a reality check. I took a reality check as to why you're here. And you say to yourself, well, and that's something you hear a lot, by the way. Let's take a reality check. Hey, man, get real. Take a reality check. Why do we have to check reality? Well, we're humans, known intergalactically in multiple dimensions as the biggest bullshit artists in the world. <laughs> we bullshit ourselves continually. I'm a Sicilian. We're champagne bullshit artists. I swear to God, the fucking guy had the meat cleaver in his head when I met him. <laughs> and then, of course, besides our natural tendency to bullshit ourselves, there is the giant, what I call the big lie. This lie is so big, so pervasive, so all extensive that you don't notice it. It's like a goldfish in water. You think a goldfish knows he's in water. You think a goldfish goes, I, I'm fucking wet. No, that's his environment. He farts, the bubble goes up. 
Look, Fred launched one. That's it. That's how this lie is. And here's the lie. That there actually is such a thing as objective, substantial, hard-edged, substantive reality. That's bullshit. Reality is not hard-edged. It does not exist per se. It's soft and mushy, malleable, squishy, fluid. It's like Gumby's dick. You can stretch it, twist it, press it on the comic book, get Mickey on the tip. That's how reality is. What's rigid is us. I'm not going to refer to us as our culture, okay? There's not there's an, a good group here. I like it. It's a tribal size group. I like the one. I feel that the tribe is very rigid. The tribe has a definition of reality. And the, the, more, the more close you are to that definition, the cooler you are. The further you're away, well, we have bad names for you. If you go far enough away, I think the name that most commonly used is, you know, he's insane. Just totally out of touch with our reality. He's fucking insane. That's a dangerous word. Insanity equals reality. And you can't really define insanity. Who are you going to ask? Scientists won't touch it. They refuse. They won't touch sanity or reality. They won't touch it. You're going to ask a lawyer. Do you remember Jeffrey Dahmer? The gentleman that ate like 12 people? I remember the headlines of the post. Dahmer found sane. He ate 12 fucking people! In my neighborhood, all you had to do was bite a guy's ear off. They called you crazy. But the New York Post says Dahmer found sane. Because lawyers made the case for him that he was sane. That's right, Your Honor. He ordered pizza. It came to his door cold, so he merely ate the delivery boy. <laughs> Can't define sanity by experts. See this guy here staring vacantly above my head? If I asked him what his definition of rampant, guaranteed insanity is, we all have the same definition. When a person does something that will cause massive damage to their physical body for no good reason, they usually insane. Do you remember three years ago, the guy that stripped naked at four in the morning and broke into the lion cages at Bronx Zoo? You gotta be fucked up. <laughs> you know, besides your brain having consciousness, your body has consciousness. Encoded in your DNA are millions of years of vital survival information. When you smell a, lo a lion long before your brain works, your asshole snaps shut. <laughs> your balls come up like landing gear. Woo! And your ass takes over. Large predator alert. I am now taking over. Go away from lion. <laughs> Apparently, this man's mind, that invisible ghost in the machine, was so insane, it overcame the rational veto of his nuts and ass. <laughs> and he got in a cage. And he didn't get a scratch, by the way. Because lions are never insane. They're observant. They took one look, they went, something's wrong. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me try something. <laughs> he didn't even pee. <laughs> Don't eat him, you'll get crazy. <laughs> Some people say I'm splitting hairs. They said, no, you're wrong about that tribal thing. What insanity means is, when you don't agree with the rest of the tribe rapidly, when you're so far from the consensus view of what is known as reality, you must be crazy. Well, here's some current events for you. I put on the television late last week, and I see a lady, she's a senator, a senator from Arizona. She's wearing a pink tank top. Uh, she was rather heavy like most Americans, because we all have asses like recreational vehicles now. <laughs> She looked good in a pink top. Kind of looked like a pink top-loading washer. <laughs> and she got my attention right away, and I was filled with warmth and love for her because my gun was jammed. <laughs> she said, I don't see why we got to take care of the earth. It's been taking care of itself for 6,000 years. <laughs> Half a mo. 6,000 years. She believes literally in the Bible. Already I see my concept of her brain shrieking to the size of a fucking BB. And then it comes out that the, what she, she's on television for is they want to mine uranium from her state in Arizona. 
Uranium is a radioactive element, as you know. It has a steady rate of decay. And that's why we know, the tribe knows, that the Earth is billions of years fucking old. <laughs> but not the pink lady. <laughs> 6,000 years. Because old Jewish people who worship thunder as God's farts told me it's 6,000 years. Well, that's the problem. That's why we need reality checks. Because everybody has got their own personal separate reality. I recently visited the West Coast, which is famous for distorting reality. You, you notice it four seconds when you come off the plane. The first thing I saw was a stewardess's aide with enormous, frightening breasts. Now, you see, ladies, you don't understand because, you see, your brain is not hooked up visually directly to your sexual response, unlike men. A woman needs silly shit like spiritual content, personality, stuff like that. <laughs> Not a man. A man looks at big giant, and I mean large. These breasts were as big as geography class globes. <laughs> And they did not respond normally to gravity. No sag. They looked up like Snoopy worshipping the moon. Man don't give a shit about spirit. He takes one look and goes, Whoa, what a woman, holy shit. Yeah, but she's not well in the head. She strangles puppies. Does she strangle them with her tits? No, well then she's all right. All right, so... <laughs> Two seconds off the plane, I meet a female with breasts like a Nazi genetic experiment. And I know that they're not made by God. If they were, they would be an object of awe. Remember what Einstein said, if you can't feel the emotion of awe, or as we would call it, oh wowness, if you're not filled with that, anything can do it. A starry sky, Niagara Falls, or those breasts. Look, look, look what God made! <laughs> Except God didn't make those breasts. Those are man-made. Those are franken-tit. <laughs> and you know what they put in them? They stuff them full of the same chemical they put in the cushions of your lawn furniture. <laughs> you might as well fuck your lounge. <laughs> so then I venture forth into La La Land, looking at totally artificial people. 80-year-old woman without a wrinkle on her face. We've had so many operations that if they blink, they fart. No skin. <laughs> Men have calf implants. That's a new one on me. I read that in an L.A. paper. Come in for calf implants. In other words, you got weak, fucked up legs. You put calf implants, you still got weak, fucked up legs, but you look really good on the way to your wheelchair. <laughs> so apparently... We all keep in our heart and in our mind an artificial, personal reality. Certain cultures celebrate the lack of reality, like L.A., so you have to have reality checks. And this is not a new thing. The concept of checking on reality or having someone tell you what the rules are for reality is really an ancient thing with us. You see, we like to have our own freedom. I have my freedom for my fucking reality and that's it. Garlic is good. If I eat 40 cloves of garlic, I won't get sick. People around me will vomit and faint, but I'll be fine. <laughs> Did you ever stand next to a Korean on a train? Jesus. <laughs> Conductor, kill me. Would you please kill me? Cha-cha <laughs> steps. I'm called the paradigm. How to cha-cha. Those little paper cha-cha steps. How to go to a dish is reality. It goes like this. Eh? And the most famous distributor of that is the Catholic Church. Back in the Middle Ages. In the old days when a white beanie meant something. Now, I had an early exposure to the Catholic Church. I went to a Catholic grammar school in a little tough Italian neighborhood with St. Carmine's, patron saint of plea bargaining. It's the only statue of a saint with a hat in front of his face. With a little slogan on his pedestal, I didn't fucking see nothing. You know, we, I was on that train yesterday. I saw a nun. She had a backup nun with her. They always come out in twos. Right? One drives the car, the other one does the hit. And she was a nun, but her feet were sticking out. She had, like, knee down. My nuns didn't have feet. They floated on a little invisible cushion of suppressed sexuality. <laughs> But 
But remember, I'm not that old. And already the Vatican's grip on reality was being challenged and loosened, modified. But in the old days, what the Pope said was real was fucking real. And that was it. One day, a guy named Bruno, they never said he smoked shit, but I think he did. He laid on the roof of his house. He was a philosopher. And he got an idea. He became convinced his idea was a new version of reality, and he told the Pope. He said, oh, Pope, well, you know, last night on the roof. Okay, I was, all right. I laid there, look at the stars that are coming to me. The earth is not the center. The sun don't go around us, we go around the sun. And the Pope says, that's a very interesting, Bruno. Get him, and they jumped him. <laughs> Two Catholic monks, I think that's where the term hood came from originally. <laughs> And they burned him to death. <laughs> that was a debate with the Catholic Church. Mm hmm, mm hmm, burn him. <laughs> a few years later, one of the Pope's buddies, a guy he had genuine affection and respect for, a man named Galileo came over. And Galileo liked to tinker, and he had invented a telescope. And he said, Oh, Pope, look, look at this thing I got. You look in here, you can see we're not the center. We go around the sun. And the Pope said, that's a very interesting, Galileo. But before you go in the public square and say this shit, I want you to relax. Remember, remember Bruno. <laughs> now relax, have some cold wine, have some roasted nuts. <laughs> and Galileo saw the error of his way. He said, you know, you're right, it's a fly shit on the lens. That's what it was. <laughs> Don't mess around with pissed off Catholics with weapons. <laughs> anyway, right now, it's not as if that battle has completely abated, eh? The Catholic Church and the spin-off forms of it, Martin Luther started that, right? The Protestantism, when he got pissed off at selling indulgences. You could do a sin and then just pay them enough and you didn't go to hell. I just stabbed a nine-year-old 11 times with an ice pick in the eye. That'll be two million dollars. <laughs> Here you go. Here's another half a million. I get him again. Uh, somehow, the Protestant movement started from that bullshit called the selling of indulgences. But now all Christian religions, particularly the fundamentalist people, like that lady, who's a fucking senator, they, they elected her as a wise leader. They could have had three little five-year-olds standing on each other's shoulders with a big coat and a hat. Would have been just as good. <laughs> They're still fighting over who gets to be the main dispenser of reality. Because remember how important it is. If the person that controls reality thinks he's like threatened, he'll crush you. And reality itself controls you in every aspect of your life, which we're going to discuss. Now, the two big fighters, the contenders for the reality consortium were the, the church, either in Christendom or in, I don't believe the Jews mess with this. They just say, there's God, don't piss him off, your fucking stock will go down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Buy a landmine for Israel. <laughs> the church still has a clash with science. Now, science has its own version of reality, eh? The scientific method, damn it, which is rooted, at least to a large degree, in materialism. Scientists, scientists say, well, 97, I'm not going to argue with the tribe. 97% of the tribe believe that science is the main arbitrator of ultimate truth and reality. Because science, damn it, proves itself constantly. And it never fucks up, except occasionally. Do you all remember, I remember Mount St. Helen, that was 22 years ago, but even New Yorkers remember that. Hey, the whole friggin' mountain made a left. Remember that? <laughs> that mountain detonated with the explosive force of five nuclear warheads. Two weeks before that mountain blew up, devastating the area, they asked a group of scientists in the area about the status of the volcano. The scientists said, we're pretty sure it's cool. We got mini seismographs all around it. We got laser beams shining from satellites onto fixed mirrors that detect the slightest motion of liquid magma. That mountain's cool. Then they went to a 92-year-old dairy farmer named Zeke in the area. Asked about the mountain farmer went, that some of a bitch gonna blow up. <laughs> See the way the cows are trying to get in the station wagon? <laughs> 
You want to know if a volcano is going to go? To hell with the scientists. Watch large creatures who tits drag in the grass. You know that's true? When I was in California, true, I met the Japanese expert on earthquakes, worldwide best guy on earthquakes, because I was a little concerned, you know. I say, hey, Doc, how can you tell when a large quake's coming? I thought he was going to mention something about compression of airways, electromagnetic anomalies. Instead, he says, watch dogs that, lay, that weigh less than 25 pounds. Like a dachshund. Take a look at a dachshund. Look how low his nuts had. He can hurt himself on a peach pit. <laughs> When there's an earthquake coming, they know. I got this buzzing thing in my balls and ass. It could be a quake, it could be a truck, who knows? Let's stand in the doorway and pray. <laughs> Scientists were challenged on reality by the church because the main contention for the existence of them, by the way, I want you to understand something. Don't reach rabbit erroneous conclusions about me. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. I don't use the G word, because I went to Catholic school. Uh, to me, the G word, God, is a big guy with a beard who has thousands of angels watching me jerk off no matter how sneaky I am. <laughs> 781, huh, Chris? <laughs> Must be a rainy weekend, huh, boy? Uh, I believe in a version of God. And the reason, you see, the, the, the hardcore atheistic scientists, who I think are totally off the wall too, they say, well, you know, why, why do you need a god? Why do you need a big king type god thing? And the obvious answer is, well, creation. Somebody had to make it. Look at this, billions of galaxies, stars, gas plates, planets, people, people in Jersey, people everywhere. <laughs> Somebody had to make all this shit. And, of course, the Catholic Church and the Christians believe, and that lady, that lady from Arizona with the tiny brain, she believes that a giant king-like man created everything, as it is. Fuck evolution. As it is. Even your shoes, all at once. He did it in a big creation shop. Working there. Fucking six days he worked. Seven days he was whacked out. Six days building shit, and shit's hard to make. Think about a snail. That's a bitch. Oh, yeah, you French guys can get him out with a little fork. You ever try getting one back in the fucking shell? How about jellyfish? God says, up all night making a goddamn jellyfish. It's like trying to build a log cabin out of snot. <laughs> and apparentness of everything that is. The creator seemed necessary. But then science comes along and says, no, no, I'm afraid you have it long, primitive fucking people. <laughs> Look at all we've given you. Electric lights, radio, flake of douche. If you want your crotch to smell like a drum of schmuckers jam, we've got it. <laughs> Why you want that, I don't know. Perhaps in your personal reality, you live on a slice of toast. <laughs> but whatever you want, we deliver to you, and we're hardly ever wrong, and we're telling you we actually have an answer for creation. It wasn't a big man in his shop, laboring away, building all the things we love. Clouds, stars, pussy. Oh, let's see, look at that. Two little rose petals and some baby oyster. Pussy. I like this thing but I think it's going to be trouble down the line. <laughs> they didn't think of a God in a creation shop. They said it all came from the Big Bang. Now, here's the Big Bang. The Big Bang says that all matter and energy, in fact, space-time itself, everything, trillions and quadrillions of stars, billions and billions of planets, gas clouds, galaxies, Jersey, Yonkers, all the people in China, all the people inventing new chicken dishes in China. All the buses, all the trains, all the elephants, all the big piles of elephant shit, everything in the whole universe was squished together into a tiny, itty bitty thing. So small, they gave it a special name, a singularity. You want to know how big a singularity is? Picture a mosquito's dick during a blizzard. <laughs> Divide by a hundred million. That's still way too big. 
You take all that stuff and squish it into something as small as a singularity, you don't need a god. It will explode. <laughs> and according to the scientists, it did. Big bang. Bam, ba 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 fucking ba ba boom. <laughs> problem. Here's the problem. Did you ever see an explosion? It's random. Shit flies everywhere. Except that all the gas clouds, all of the, the pre-star galactic clouds, all of that stuff, all the matter, even the energy, flung out, but it didn't fling out in a random manner. If it did, to the force of gravity, over time, it would have squinched back together into a giant booger of nothingness. <laughs> Instead, it was perfectly balanced, like the most magnificent poem or piece of music, so that stars could form. Regular stars our sun size, planets, living creatures, carbon-based, us, people everywhere, Shriners, everyone. <laughs> now some scientists say, well, that was just a random accident. A British physicist who was so smart he worked with Hawkins was asked, what are the odds of a random enormous explosion causing a perfect balance in gravity so that we had the universe we know that enabled our life and our consciousness to form. And he figured it out. You ready for this? 10 with 51 zeros to 1. That's a million, trillion, billion, fucking quadrillion, quadrillion, fucking trillion, billion, zillion, quadrillion, fucking bazillion to 1. The same odds of you winning the lotto 11 years in a row every day. <laughs> Tripping over a beer can and seeing Bigfoot fucking Elvis in a UFO on one day. In other words, an incredible long shot. <laughs> Scientists maintain this fucking happened. They're very optimistic people. They got this going, you know? They got the fight going. The reality fight is going on, and so far the scientists are winning. Because, you see, they give you everything you want. There's a lady looking at a watch. That watch has a, a, a head that glows. There's phosphorus in it. The scientists did that. Many of you have quartz watches. Even that stupid lady from Arizona. She has a quartz watch that you never have to wind because the magic winding angel comes at night and does it. <laughs> so you got to accept that shit, except there's only there's one problem. I, I, I'll exemplify it by an experiment done right here in New York City. New York is like hometown stuff. So some people in New York, at NYU, they did a wonderful experiment from scientists. They took two pieces of steel, vanadium steel, and they polished them. Super, 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 super polished. Speed freaks with toothbrushes. <laughs> they made these things more polished than anything before. And they squished them together, almost touching but not touching. A tiny space in between. Really small, like a, a billionth of a snatch hair. That's a technical scientific term. The standard snatch hair is kept in Geneva in a vacuum sealed vault. And then they sucked out all any mana that might be in there and they gouged it with magnets so any energy that might be in there was not in there. And they created more zip, ugats, bupkis, zero, nint than ever before. They created so much bupkis, nint, ugats that they gave it a name, a special name. They called it a quantum vacuum. And they were watching this quantum vacuum and they were proud of themselves. Look at that, Bill. More nothing shit than ever before. This is nothing. This is really nothing. And then all of a sudden, out of that absolutely guaranteed nothingness, a little something popped out. A subatomic particle. An Italian one. A neutrino. It looked around and said, Buongiorno, fuck you and split. It hung around for 24,000 of a second and then it disappeared. Now let's get really real. Suppose you and I were allowed in that lab. If we were in that lab and we saw absolutely guaranteed nothingness, the big cube, quantum vacuum, and all of a sudden something popped out and then went back into nothingness, we would be filled with awe. We would be, holy shit! What the fuck does that mean? What are the implications of that? From nothing and then back into nothing. What does that mean? And as soon as you ask the scientist for meaning, panic sets in. <laughs> the hell do you mean, mean? We're scientists. We give you all this good shit. We don't deal in meaning. 
What are we, philosophers? Do you see me with a pointed hat with moons and stars on it? No. I'm in a white coat. I could stick my finger up your ass legally. I'm an approved scientist. We do not deal in meaning. But you and I, well, we're just regular humans. Meaning means everything. But scientists, by the way, I gotta tell you something. I tried this, because I have scientist friends. Some of them are Cartesian reductionists, which means a straight scientist. You cannot get them to look at meaning. Do you ever have a, you ever have a dog shit on a rug and try to get him to look at it? Look what you did! No, no, I can't look around it. That's a rather nice molding on that wall over there. I, I never noticed how beautiful the sunlight is that plant. No, look at the shit. No, no, look at the ceiling. That's what I want to do. That's how scientists are with meaning. They will not look at it. No, they won't. Fuck meaning. We won't look at it. No, we won't. And yet humans, that's all that matters to us. All the other stuff is trimmings. What really matters is how you feel and what something means. You know, you mean the world to me. Hey, what did you mean by that? <laughs> meaning is everything for human beings. We're the meaning makers. That's what we are. Here's the truth. You want to know the truth? There's nothing out there. There's no color. Oh, look at that beautiful blue. There's no blue. There's no purple, no orange, no sweet, no sour, no beauty, no ugly, no good, no bad. There's a radically ambiguous quantum soup. We come along and we give it meaning. We create everything and we add meaning to it. The scientists are frightened of that shit. They don't want to know about meaning. But like the dog with the poop, in order to be trained to recognize meaning, they have to have their nose forced in it. And recently they just we have for keeping low cholesterol because want to live forever. Typical, typical American. I want to live to be about 700 years old and die on a treadmill while masturbating. I try to reach orgasm simultaneously with the five mile point. And in order to do that, we keep the cholesterol low in our food intake so that we don't clog up our pump, as they call it. I am part of this phenomenon. I don't want to be, but my old lady's a vegetarian. I had a lot of roughage. I shit wicker furniture. <laughs> Last week I passed a divot. Because you gotta keep that cholesterol low. Well, scientists did an experiment. They took a group of two groups of rabbits, you know, adolescent rabbits. One group during the day and one group at night. And they gave them little balls of pure fat rejected from McDonald's. No, that's not healthy. <laughs> Cook the french fries in the Vitalis with the boiled down pig foot. That's good. <laughs> this fat is bad. They took the bad fat and they colored it orange. And because yeah, scientists do that. <laughs> Make it look like a carrot. <laughs> and they gave both groups, the daytime group of rabbits and the nighttime group, equal amounts of pure fat. The daytime group behaved exactly as they should. They got little rabbit heart attacks and strokes and they dropped dead. But the nighttime group showed no ill effects. We're hot shit. We're bunny rabbits. We're adolescent. We're cute and we fuck continually. <laughs> they couldn't understand this. So they figured what it was was human error. They figured the nighttime crew was goofing off and not giving the rabbits their allocated amount of lethal fat. So they did what many employers do nowadays, that privacy has fallen away. They hide cameras and they watch them. And they were shocked. They found out that the nighttime rabbits got the same amount of fat as the daytime rabbits. But the nighttime guy, he had, you know, the daytime guy was a quick, hurry up, hurry up, New York guy. Come on, you little fucking rats with long ears, eat them. I got shit to do, I gotta clean my gun and beat my kids, hurry up. The nighttime guy, he had time on his hands. Long head, hippie scientist, time on his hands, and he liked rabbits. Oh, look at the cute little fucking thing. You know, he's squeezing me shits. Look at that. <laughs> cute little fuzzy thing. Oh, I like an earmuff. Here, here, let's play airplane. Mm -hmm. Here's your fat. Mm -hmm. Here's your fat. And here's what happened. He gave them love, and he gave them affection, and he gave them a sense of caring. All invisible things, by the way. And those invisible things, the meaning of those invisible things, rerouted lethal, proven lethal fat to a non-lethal area. I mean, do you know what the American 
Heart Association now says is the leading cause of heart attacks? Not cholesterol. Anger and isolation. Fucking son of a bitch! <laughs> Motherfucking traffic! <laughs> I'm gonna run over that old lady. <laughs> fuck it! And fuck your wheelchair too, you son of a bitch! You scratch my car, I'll kick your hearing aid out! <laughs> When you take that kind of anger and you're isolated, yeah. I take tolls. I take tolls and stay in this booth. You fucking asshole! <laughs> Kills you. Kills you. You see, we live in a world which, quite apparently, is totally out of balance. I mean, not like this. Like this. Towards the material. We don't believe in the invisible. We mock it. What the hell do you mean, the invisible spirit look? That's bullshit. Hey, if I can't see it, taste it, smell it, buy it, fuck it, or hide it in my special jaw, it don't exist. <laughs> the only problem is, everything that we see in the tangible physical world, the world of the non-invisible, came from the invisible. Let's postulate a thought experiment. Let's Popular and you. cheap. I'm sure most of you came from Manhattan. You're wearing pith helmets and it's hot out. But let's say some of you braver people came from Queens. And on your way here, you pass one of those testosterone soaked asshole drivers driving one of those SUV tank wannabe vehicles. And he cut you off. You did what any New Yorker would do, man or woman. You gave him the finger. <laughs> the Italian salute. Hey, for you and your whole family. <laughs> but just before you gave that man that vulgar gesture, a little thought came out and said, you know, fuck him. And then you acted on it. And then he shot at you. And reality spins out. <laughs> but that thought was invisible. That's an invisible thing. You can't show me a five-pound bag of fuck you. It's an invisibleness. It's non-material. And by the way, it did pop out. It didn't walk past several other thoughts. My ass hurts, I'm hungry, I gotta brush my teeth. Oh, by the way, fuck you. No, it popped out of nothingness, and then it went back into, one, into nothingness. Sound familiar? Just like the quantum vacuum. All of reality comes from nothingness and goes back into nothingness. But now the scientists had their faces pushed in this. The fucking something acted as a prophylactic for death-dealing fat that we gave little rabbits and waited for them to die. Hurry up, die. Die, bunny, die. Said they didn't die. Fuck you, I think I'll run on the wheel while humping. <laughs> so they had to start looking at this, this invisible shit. Now they realized that in their minds, and in most people's minds, meaning, the invisible, is processed in the mind. And as soon as they started looking into the human mind, well, then they went into the rabbit hole. If I ask, especially about so me, where is your mind? Invisible. Most people answer, well, it, it's right here. About an inch above my eyebrow. You know like we eat lemon ice, you get that pain in your head? <laughs> That's where my mind is, right there. Well, I'm afraid not. Your mind isn't there. Your mind is like the Beatles song. Here, there, and everywhere. You receive, you see, a lot of people think, the brain generates the mind. Your brain then generates through chemical electrical processes and neural discharges, and the epiphenomena of that is consciousness, but it generates what we call the mind. Only, and by the way, you know where they got that idea? During the Civil War. Some guy put his head up. I don't see any Yankees. <laughs> and a musket ball blew the back of his head off. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but they fixed it up with leather and horseshoes and shit like that. They didn't have fancy equipment back then. And ever since Zeke got the back of his head blown off, he acted kind of funny. Like in the middle of a conversation, he'd break into yodeling. And so the cap. And he wore kilts and rubber shoes. You know, ever since Zeke got the back of his head blown off, he'd been acting kind of weird. Well, that's because the brain, the scientist said, is where consciousness comes from. If the brain is damaged, then of course you get damaged consciousness, like Zeke urinating on the piano and talking in Gaelic. <laughs> Except it's not true. Your brain receives your mind and your consciousness from out there, from something called the zero point field. Look, here's the reality as far as cutting edge people and cool people everywhere know. We live in an ocean of consciousness. We share it. 
We share one brain, one spirit. We share this consciousness, an ocean. And through this ocean run strong currents of meaning that we create, meaning and value. There's life summed up. In other words, it's like a radio station. It's you receiving the signal that is you. W-W-Y-O-U, coming to you from the field. Here I am right now. Every time you look in the mirror, you restructure yourself. Yep, that's me. That's me. I hate liver. I love pussy. That's me. <laughs> and you remember who you are, and you start living by receiving W-Y-O-U, you, you, you. But you don't, you don't generate this shit. You receive this shit. And they, when they started looking into the human brain, they really started to understand we are in an ocean of consciousness. And the DNA in our cells act like little antennas. And they receive signals about how to do stuff, how to be, how to grow organs. Received uh, this stuff. I'll give you a, a good example. First of all, forget science. Everybody here, I would take a bet that 60% of the people here had have cases of what's called extrasensory perception. It's not. It's just perception as we quite don't understand it yet. Twins that have the same antenna, same DNA, have been known for thousands of years to share a thought at a great distance. Distance means nothing. In World War II, a guy from Brooklyn, family, would know, hey, Vinny got shot in the ass by a jack. And he would know that from a great distance. It still happens. Hey, Bill, did you get a blowjob today around 3 o'clock? <laughs> Look, man, I was in mass, okay? <laughs> That's an incredibly embarrassing thing at high mass. Do me a favor and beat me next time. We share the same damn consciousness. We share the same concept of being because of this ocean of consciousness. Now, a British scientist, I love the British, by the way. Not only do they think out of the box, they're quietly raving mad. <laughs> Remember they fought us in the revolution, right? They walked and they stood in straight lines wearing a red jacket with a white cross over their heart. Where our men dressed as trees. <laughs> Want a tea bag, Luke? <laughs> and of course, they fucking lost. But they kept coming. We're British. We're pretty fucked. We think China is ours. <laughs> Anything they like, they took. We like tea, we want China. We like rubber, we want India. I like the elephants too, bring them all. <laughs> they have a scientist there called Rupert Sheldrake. If it wasn't for certain prejudices among the hierarchy of the new religion, the new dominant religion that 97% of us believe in is called scientism. The unquestioned belief that the discipline and widely accepted truth forum known as science is the only arbitrator of truth. Well, Rupert Sheldrake didn't fit in, see? Although he was up for the Nobel Prize. The other scientists, you know, the real hardcore one that never get laid with a lot of dandruff on their shoulders. <laughs> I've seen pussy in books. <laughs> it's frightening, blown up eight times normal size. <laughs> they said that Rupert can't get the Nobel Prize, and here's what he proved. He proved that there was such a thing. You see, there's nothing but energy and information. In this ocean of consciousness, there's energy and information in it. What he said is there's fields. The way you receive radio is in a field, electromagnetic field. He said there's a field within this consciousness. And he gave it a name. He called it morphic fields. And he said it tells animals what to do. It tells, it tells basically organs how to grow. And he did it in a really cool experiment. He took rats, not New York City rats. <laughs> he took trained rats, rats that had been to Harvard. In a jar, but they went to Harvard. And he made them run a maze. Because if you tell a New York City rat to run a maze, you go, yeah, run this. <laughs> as soon as he made a critical amount, like 531 rats ran the maze, in London, the same genetically perfect rats, because these are inbred genetic rats, Al Alpha Day 1, they're like the rats from Deliverance. <laughs> they share one chromosome. The same identical genetic rats in New York ran the maze in half the time. How does that happen? You've got to believe one of two things. Either Sheldrake's right, and there are morphic fields that contain information, and that the genetically similar rats 
passed on that information automatically to the New York City rats. Either you gotta believe in that, or that the rats had a little tiny fucking cell phone, all right? <laughs> Make a left at the red dot. <laughs> Stay away from the syphilis experiment. <laughs> he did it with people. The New York, I mean, excuse me, the London Times crossword puzzle is world famous. He made an arrangement with the publisher and he had 100,000 copies come out premature so that the puzzle could be solved. After that happened, the normal population solved it in half the time. How the fuck did that happen? Your mind is connected to an ocean of consciousness which generates a hologram called reality. And it's fucking powerful. I mean, real. do you know what, this is this blows, I just read this, just gotta share this with you because it's fairly connected thematically. When an outback uh, aborigine in uh, Australia gets pissed at you, he doesn't do the civilized thing and hire a Sicilian to kill you. <laughs> he takes a sharpened stick with m urine on it and, and a couple of precious stones and he gives it to the witch doctor and the witch doctor says some words and burns some incense and then he tells you to sneak up on a guy you hate and point the stick at him. Sure enough, they drop dead. The people who get the stick pointed at them drop dead within three days. Usually from diarrhea, dehydration, they just fucking drop dead. It's so effective that the Australian government now made pointing a stick at somebody assault with a deadly weapon! <laughs> if you could get fucking sent to jail for murder by pointing a good humor stick at somebody. <laughs> Well, that's the placebo effect. Nothing new there. We scientists, white coat guys, no pussy, lots of books. We know about the placebo effect. I give this lady a pill. I tell her it's a mood elevator, but it's nothing but sugar. All of a sudden, she's fucking happy. Well, it also works with antibiotics and blood pressure drugs. How? The thought. What's a thought made of? Zero. I mean, the thought, I can't show you a big pound, a big five pound bag of fuck you, I like tits, boy, I love pizza. I can't show you that shit. It's invisible. But these thoughts are so powerful that they create the reality we know. The placebo effect has enormous implications. What does it imply when a thought creates your reality? It implies a lot. It implies that you, in that ocean of consciousness, create reality. And now I can feel it, by the way. I have a sense, I've been doing this for years. I can feel some of the intellectual, hardcore people in the audience going, you know, you're full of shit. What about everyday goddamn reality? What are you going off on? What are you going off on a tangent here? What about reality here? I'm 23 years old, I get an erection when the humidity changes. <laughs> the only thing that counts is money and pussy. In fact, that'd be absolute heaven if you could find a woman that when she comes, gold drops out of her ass, that'd be fucking heaven. <laughs> That's the out of balance, materialistic, sick, fucked up world we live in. That's the world that produced the economic collapse. That's the world that produced <laughs> competition beyond description. Malignant levels of competition instead of oneness and, and cooperation. You know what I saw last night? A commercial for a weed killer. You know, you want to kill your crabgrass, you squirt it with this shit, right? Sure, it kills your dog and makes your kid go a little thing on his head, but <laughs> it does kill the crabgrass well. And they had a guy come out with the weed killer in a holster. <laughs> and his neighbor, another American, big fat lot ass with shorts, <laughs> comes out, right? You yeah, haven't eaten in minutes. <laughs> oh, look, a bird. <laughs> comes out and they play the music from high noon. And they have a gunfight with the weed killers. They whip them out and they squirt them and see who can kill the weed first. Why is that? Because of the basic paradigm that runs our country and the world. Materialism. No values exist. Compassion, love, caring, a connection to everything else that keeps you happy inside. That don't exist. What exists is Hardcore materialism. And that means the only way you can really be happy is to be in competition with fucking everybody else. And I do mean everybody. You want to know why? Well, because our world, and I'm not going to inflame anyone with feminist concepts. I hope the world becomes more feminized. I don't mean with the estrogen that's coming from the insecticide. That's scary. 
I don't like to see an oak tree with tits. That's frightening. <laughs> but the feminine consciousness of open receptivity and instinct is well, the only thing that can save this planet. But right now, we live in a male-dominated world. You don't believe me? Go over to a, one of you modern Western ladies here. Go over to Afghanistan. Tell them you want to wear the cut-down bra. And then wear the heavy hat. Because you will be stoned! <laughs> I'm telling you that male domination is what's leading us off the cliff. And I'm Italian. I'm very male. I love maleness. But I realize that the consciousness dominated by the male hormone, the Italian hormone, <laughs> testosterone, <laughs> is fucking us. <laughs> But I would ask you to remember something. Now remember, if I forget, you tell me. I'm going to walk away from testosterone for a minute. I want to rem remind you of something. When we all went to school, they told us things were made of atoms, right? Little tinker toy there, little electron going around, right? Now they say there's no atom. There's no atom. When they look close, you know what they find? You've probably heard of string theory. That's the latest theory about how everything is made of. You can get down to the inside and find those weird particles, muons, guons, zuons, buons. And by the way, they're all made up in the mind. They're mathematically extrapolated into things. I'm sure an Italian discovered a neutrino. If he was a wasp, he would have discovered a buffy. It's definitely a buffy, possibly a chip. But certainly a buffy. But now they found out there are no atoms, that everything is made of vibrating strings of energy. What do you call a vibrating string of energy? Music. That's what the universe is made of. Music. What do you mean? Look at this rock. If I throw this rock into your Buick, you'll be pissed. It's a rock. Well, it's made of silicon, iron oxide, carbon, etc. And then you all vibrate. Those strings vibrate and they come together. They make carbon, silicon. Then they all get together and they form a band. A rock band. <laughs> it's the only pun I make. Don't move me, I'll shoot you in the head. I could have made it a tit band. I could have made it a pile of bear shit band. But rock band has a certain ring to it. Hey, Woodstock, 40 years ago today, I still got a tab. So, if so everything is made dominates world politics, religion, how we respond to each other in everyday living, how we handle the economic collapse because of our overbalanced fixation with the material, all comes from the Italian molecule testosterone. <laughs> and testosterone is a tough son of a bitch. First of all, he's got a big ego. Everything is mine. Very territorial. Very ter That's my car. You don't believe me? I'm going to piss around my car. <laughs> That's my house. That's my wife. Don't look up, baby. <laughs> Not only does testosterone make us territorial, it makes us egotistical. You know everything I have is our bigger. My dick is bigger. My wallet's bigger. My house is bigger. My government's bigger. And my God is bigger and more loving. And if you don't believe me, we'll fucking kill you. <laughs> because of testosterone, which is made of nothing. You know, that must be, to reflect a moment, that must be a pretty magical, incredibly intelligent nothing. Because it creates everything. Now, of course, you female human beings, you have a hormone also, which dominates your emotional life and your outlook on life. But you have a wonderful one. I kind of think it's angelic. I mean, you have estrogen. I even like the name. It sounds like a little Mexican guy. <laughs> manana, manana. Testosterone gives men their sexual basing. It drives them fucking crazy. And any, that's why guys do crazy shit. Any, every man here tonight has at least 350 million hyperact little sperm cells down there. That's crowded. You basically have Tokyo in your nuts. That'll make anybody fidgety. That's why guys do crazy shit. I'm going to drive 90 miles an hour and cut off that truck. You want to know why? Because I got a crowd in my balls and they're impatient. That's why. <laughs> In fact, they're chanting, Pass the truck! Pass the truck! <laughs> you ladies have that estrogen. Forget hundreds of millions. One egg a month. No pushing, no shoving. No long lines. 
And it takes 28 days to make that journey. That's slow and mellow. Poor man river. That's why women have a more intelligent sexual situation. Not men, let's fuck, let's fuck now. But we're in a clothing store, Finny. <laughs> we're in the coats and it's the summer. Who's gonna fuck and come back here? <laughs> Estrogen's more rational. They have cameras, Finny. <laughs> this is worse than getting caught stealing a scarf. Humping under the tweed coats <laughs> in Macy's. You want that on your permanent record? <laughs> Every fabric that you can think of to test and twist to gauge our civilization is impacted by hormonal influence and belief systems. And it's important you understand we do live out of balance. You want to see, you know, when you want to show people out of balance, it's good to come across with grotesque examples. Bernie Madoff. How could Bernie Madoff hurt, crush, cause enormous pain to hundreds of thousands of innocent people? Many of them elderly, many of them handicapped. He didn't give a shit. Because to give a shit, you'd have to have compassion. An invisible thing. Hey, fuck, invisible. I'm the guy with the weed chiller. I fucking win. I hump everybody. Stars, crippled people, old people. I screw them all. So I get all his money. Now Bernie is in prison in his honeymoon cell. <laughs> with a big guy named Bubba that likes his legs. <laughs> Bubba don't believe in lubricant. Fuck lubricant. <laughs> Blood will do. <laughs> There's poor Bernie wearing a moo moo. <laughs> Pink flip flops. <laughs> And he's got a little stack of loose leaf paper that he cut to the size of $100 bills. And he cowers in the back of his cell, flicking, flipping him in front of his ear. Fuck <laughs> 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 Bernie! That's my Italian homo. My overconsciousness says, Bernie is me. We share one giant mind with Bernie. Okay, Bernie's brain received Bernie. His parents modified it, and his you senses took in all of his bliss. See, and people ask me, what the hell is bliss? And the only way I can describe it is by referencing something that's not, which is five senses. Taste, sound, sight, smell, and blah. What can I say? Yeah, you know, bliss is like uh, getting laid with haagen dazs ice cream in your mouth and holding a winning lotto ticket. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that, except you don't need the ticket or the getting late or the haagen -Dazs. Bliss is the feeling of ecstasy and peace, deep peace and ecstasy that comes just in the knowledge of existence. You know who has that? Every one of us when we're babies. I don't mean big enough to walk around and want a toy. I want the G.I. Joe. No, I'm talking little. When you're like this big and you have no nervous system, you know, you look like an old Navajo and... No efficient nervous system has developed yet. You say, wait, bye-bye, you shit your pants. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I tried, my bad. Go over to that little baby. Press him on the belly. Gently. Two things happen simultaneously. He farts and he laughs. Now, he's not laughing at the fart. He's a baby. He don't know what a fart is. Baby hears a fart and goes, what the fuck is that? A baby has an unconvoluted, untainted, pure brain. He is pure human spirit before it grows up and gets tainted. And that fart bubbled out naturally from pressure on the diaphragm. And the laughter bubbled out naturally from stimulation of what that baby was. Pure fucking happiness. So if we are pure happiness, how come we can't get in touch with it continually? Because of our belief systems. Because of our, you gotta have this, you gotta have that. I'll give you an idea. A good gauge as to how in touch we are with our fundamental nature, which is bliss and happiness, is what our happiness quotient is. You know what the New York Times says America ranks? 23rd in happiness. 23rd! There's third world countries with flies. <laughs> I'm happy. When did you eat last Wednesday? What do you do for the holidays? Kill the flies. And they're happy. We're 23rd in happiness. 
then a country, I think it's Burma, what used to be called Burma, I believe it's Burma, has a, a not, they printed a national happiness quotient. Another small country in the same area called Bhutan has a ministry of happiness. They go around, are you happy? Are you fucking happy? <laughs> Come on, are you happy? Your ox died, are you fucking happy? And they're happy, much happier than us. We're so unhappy that the happiest years of our lives, when you're young and vigorous, and basically when men are just a delivery system for the genitals, go. <laughs> I had no plans for today, well then I'll show you some. <laughs> and you women at that age all wanna look hot shit. I don't care if I've only got four brain cells. Look at my ass. I gave an erection to a dead Egyptian mummy yesterday. And therefore, I feel fulfilled. We weigh 23rd because we are run by hormones and belief systems. And our belief system says, consume, buy. There's no connection to the baby, that's over. When that umbilical cord got cut, your connection to bliss got cut. The only way you can get happy now is by certain happiness rule book shit. We'll tell you how to be happy. Do you own this car? Do you own that car? Book that was a car. huge trillion seller lately was a book called The Secret. You know about The Secret? Which is an exemplification of a real law called the law of attraction. Look, there really is nothing but energy and information. Even the atom is nothing but vibrating energy. So the law of attraction, The Secret, says if you put forth, emo especially emotions, not just thoughts, but emotions about what you want in a positive sense, you'll draw it to you, and you will. But here's the trick. You don't just get out there and go, Buick, I want a Buick, I want a fucking Buick, give me a goddamn Buick, I don't want a Chevy, I want a Buick, I don't want a Toyota, Buick, 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 Buick. I want Buick. What do I want? Buick. You're not gonna get the fucking Buick. The law of attraction works like this. You've got to send out the emotions that you already have the Buick without having it. That's hot. I'd love the fucking Buick. Oh, I love my new Buick. Smell that? Smells like car pussy. New car smell. <laughs> Here's my Buick's horn. Eh, eh, eh. This is my Buick. Whose Buick? My Buick. I'm in the Buick. I'm in the fucking Buick right now. Oh, the seat's hot in the sun. My Buick. If you send those vibes out there, you'll probably get a Buick. Because you see, resonance is what happens. You know when you rub the edge of a wine glass, and across the room, another identical wine glass, that's the law of resonance. And the law of resonance is the beginning of the law of attractions. That's why the secret works. Of course, you have to have the handy knack of imagining you have the Buick when you don't. Now, many of us are in financial stress. We're scared shit. And the TV frightens you every day. Be afraid, be afraid. Fuck that, Lord, things are going bad. They're going fucking bad. They're off the cliff. It's economic meltdown. Put your money in gold. Pick out the kid of your five kids that you don't like the most because you might have to eat them, okay? <laughs> you didn't do well in school, little Stevie. Now get in the microwave. <laughs> get away from fear because the equation to happiness is fear is fear of unhappiness. That's all it is. Unhappiness is fear that you're going to be more unhappy or not get happier. And the only way you can get happy is with material shit. That's why you've got to eat your smallest child. Stash your fucking money and get ready to kill your neighbors if things really get bad. <laughs> sure, if things get bad, you could, you could eat an old person. <laughs> Are you clean, Luke? <laughs> I notice you've been jogging. That means you're kind of lean. <laughs> If things get bad, we'll go all the way to fucking cannibalism if we have to. Of course, that's if you stay in your box. The box that society wants you into. And we live in the Bernie matter. Oh boy, we're on fucking so I'm sorry. But there's some current events that come into my mind that I have to mention to you. You know, of course, we're in a materialistic world, right? One of the executives of the Blackwater Group, Blackwell Group, excuse me, Blackwater of the good people that kill you for money, <laughs> Not like my people who at least do it one to one, eh? <laughs> These people do it in mass, Blackwater. But Blackwell is a financial group. And one guy makes $1.2 million a day. <laughs> Fuck him! Does he put in extra days on the weekend for double time? <laughs> what the hell do you do for a day that pays you a million point two? 
You, grow a leg. No cancer. You, be taller. You, two dicks. You want that? <laughs> Materialism. And by the way, the uh, scientists are holding tight. They're starting to see through quantum physics that people are moving towards spirituality, they stepped on their own dick. Quantum physics says everything is invisible, that there's no edge. This guy and me, you and me, there's no real edge to us. We blend. Just like the buildings and trees. You lean against the building, you become part of the building. It's 1968 again. All your fondest acid hallucinations have been qualified by quantum physics. And now, you know, the scientists are getting kind of iffy. Shit, they're starting to say the invisible is important. They're starting to say meaning's important. They're starting to say love and compassion might have tangible impact on the molecules in our body. And they do, by the way. A wonderful woman named Candace Pert wrote a book called The Molecules of Emotion. You laughed, and you felt good. You know why? Because when you laugh, your brain secretes a chemical called endorphin, like I said, which is known as indigenous morphine, which means you all got fucking high. What made the endorphin? Nothingness. Just being happy, and you made endorphin. Same on a roller coaster. You know the people that love roller coaster rides? Those are the people that always put the hand over the head. Oh, I fucking love it! Oh, oh, I love it! My tits are floating! I love it! <laughs> they take blood samples from those people that just came off the cyclone in Coney Island, and they find interleukin in huge amounts. Interleukin costs $50,000 a gram. It's the strongest cancer fighter in the world. But all you gotta do is take a ride on a roller coaster. If you love the roller coaster. I hate the fucking roller coaster. <laughs> I don't put my hand over my head. I'm under the goddamn safety bar. You couldn't get me out of that damn roller coaster car with a chain tied to my nuts, tied to the back of a bus. I'm in that fucking car. My asshole snaps shut. <laughs> if you take blood samples out of me after a roller coaster ride, instead of having endorphin, the happiness, feel good, gee, I'm high, I feel wonderful, chemical, instead you get cortisol. Regions exam chemical. <laughs> Fuck, I'm tense. Oh, Jesus, I'm tense. Bang, bang, bang. I did that just to relax. I'm sorry, sister. <laughs> because you're tense. And by the way, our society, our materialist, and I'm not a communist, man. I like material shit. I just don't like the psychic emphasis. That's the only way to get happy. They like you in a little box. If they can keep the definition of what you are shrunken down to this. Look at your commercials. I'm going to trim this belly down. Look, washboard abs. I have the high IQ of yogurt, but I have washboard on yeah. <laughs> I look good physically. That's LA. I look really fucking good. Therefore, I am happy. Look at that ring. Look at that diamond. Looks like the headlight of a motorcycle. The fact that I just killed my husband with a hammer is irrelevant. <laughs> he gave me this ring first. <laughs> Stay in a box. The box wants you making money. The box wants you hooked up to happiness through materiality, which means you gotta produce. Make money, make money, make money. How many jobs do you have? I have 11 and a half fucking jobs. I sleep about an hour every other fucking month, okay? I saw my kids in a photo. I waved once when I went by in the car to my job. I have 11 fucking jobs, okay? And you know how I do it? With Red Bull. I suck Red Bull, I go to work. I buy more Red Bull, I go to work. I run out of money, I kill everybody around me, take their fucking money, and buy more Red Bull, because I gotta work more, work, work, fucking work. Or I'll be unhappy. <laughs> this is not the first time, certainly, that you've heard this bullshit. You've heard this stuff all your life. Certain people, Maharashis, gurus, etc., etc., rabbis, people, Sufis, <laughs> the famous ones. <laughs> remember, remember the troublemaker when God sent his kid down here? Remember that? Jesus, remember? He came out and said the same shit. Pissed off the hierarchy of the Jews. They had him hit. They hired Italians to do the job. You know? <laughs> what does he do? He's a carpenter? Make it look like an accident. Something with wood and nails. <laughs> How'd he get like that on a cross? He was making a table. <laughs> and he lost the instructions. <laughs> and things just got chaotic from there on. I'm glad I share a box with you. We can break out of this box. It's easy. You don't need grenades. 
You don't need explosives. You don't even need a plan. All you need to do is, like they say, like Jesus. I want to mention Jesus because he was cool. He said, go within. Look within. Go quiet. That's a bitch to go quiet, by the way. It's really hard for us to go quiet. Why? Because we're 21st century Americans, God damn it. We're the most centrally overloaded, spoiled sons of bitches in the world. You thought the Romans were bad, having people fight naked with garden implements in the Colosseum. Having a donkey fuck a prostitute to death. That was a Wednesday matinee. But you know what they didn't have? They didn't have the remote control unit. You do. Look what you can do. World War II, blue whales fucking, giant squid, big pig swallowing a snake, earthquake, fire. With your finger. You have that power of stimulation. You make Nero look like a Mormon in the barn. You've got all that stimulation. I'm asking you, and Jesus was asking you, and all the Maharishis and all the Swamis are asking you to go quiet and go inside. You do that, you'll find happiness, and you won't need all the shit. And here's the weird thing. The secret works. Once you're happy and you want something and your happiness is not totally connected to it, even if it's food for your kids. If you're happy first, you'll get the food for your kids. You'll get the Buick. You'll get whatever the hell you want. Unless you want something very strange, like a pubic strobe light. <laughs> they sell those in Los Angeles. In case nobody noticed your size 81 floating tits, you can put your pubic strobe light on. And with a road throw up your ass, you'll meet someone. Uh, California, the home of completely artificialness, they have a term for it now, culturally, it's called the Los Angelization of the planet. Superficial. Only get happy to a stimulation of the superficial. You see, the only thing that counts is how other people see me. That's the only thing that counts. That's why the bodybuilders lift weights. Do you ever see those guys? I don't mean guys that are in good shape. I mean the guys that don't know when to stop. These guys. Look at this shit. I can't even wipe my ass. Here's five bucks. Wipe my ass. Help. Female bodybuilders. I saw them on television last night. Oh my God, fucking frightening. I saw 180 world-class female bodybuilders. All I heard was, that was my testicles going back up into the fetal sacs. And my dick was going, hide, run, hide, run. Find a tree, find a tree to climb. <laughs> These women weren't like normal women. Normal women are nice and squinchy and soft because you have an extra layer of fat under the skin to keep the fetus warm. These women had no fat in their whole fucking body. They were made of crazy glue and wire coat hangers. <laughs> and they didn't have little tits. They had no tits. They had razor sharp nipples that cut glass. <laughs> And they brag about this. I'm in terrific shape. I can crush a lead pipe with my vaginal muscles. That's not a handy knack to have. Unless you've got a really stuck jar lid in the house. Some of you sick bastards actually imagine that. You're right, it was a skippy peanut butter jar. Stay in your box.